One of the greatest needs that every one of us has is to be loved and to love. In what has been well described as the golden text of the Bible, Jesus said, as recorded in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a passage that's very closely related to that, to which I wish to call your attention at this time. And I hope that you'll get your Bible and read along with me as we turn to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34. And I'll be reading through verse 40. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We cannot be saved if we do not love God and love our neighbor. The Bible teaches us that if we do not love our brother whom we have seen, then we cannot love God whom we have not seen. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. And we find also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 22, If any man love not the Lord, let him be anathema. And so you see the Bible plainly, unequivocally teaches that if you do not love the Lord, you will be anathema. That means that you rest under the curse of God. So, let us, every one of us, think about it prayerfully, seriously. If we do not love God, we will be lost. And why do we love him? How does it happen that one person comes to love God and another does not? One loves God because he comes to know of God's love for him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. When you read the Bible and you find the great truths such as John 3.16, which we've already noted, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that lets us know, every one of us, that God loves us, that God really does love each one of us. He loves us with all of our faults, with all of our sins. He loved us not because we were free of sin, but in spite of the fact that we were sinners and that we are. In our study at this hour, I want us to note two basic points. How God loves us. I want to study with you on this matter because if we learn how God loves us, then it will be the means of our coming to love him in return if we respond as we ought. And then in the second place, I want us to look at if we love God, then what will we do? How will we act if we are a lover of God? So these two points, how God loves us and how we'll act if we love him in return. Now, as we turn to the problem of trying to help each one of us to learn more about how God loves us, I want to point out to you that The Bible uses again and again and again illustrations from everyday life. God tells us about himself by calling our attention to things that we already know about in everyday life. Just like we know about farming and building houses and fishing and hunting and being a soldier or running, running a race, being an athlete, fighting a war as a soldier. The Lord calls our attention to various things that we're familiar with, such as being a shepherd or giving a banquet, inviting people to your home for a meal, or being a husband or a wife or a mother or father. Now the Lord says, as he calls our attention to these various things and points out certain things about them, he's telling us about himself and telling us how he loves us. I dare say that there isn't anything that any of us needs to know more than to know that we're loved. Every husband, every wife needs to know that they're loved by their spouse. 
Every child needs to know that he's loved by his mother and father. Every Christian needs to know that he's loved by other Christians. Everybody needs to know that he's loved. And, of course, it's a sad thing to say that we know that many people are not loved. They're outcasts and so on. But everyone who loves God loves them in spite of that. Even if he doesn't know them, he knows of them and loves them. So let's think now about some illustrations from everyday life. In Psalms 23, the Bible teaches, The Lord is my shepherd. You see, God is saying, I'm like a shepherd, like a shepherd with sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's saying, God loves me so much, he's like a shepherd who provides for his sheep, he protects them from the wolves, he takes them out to where there's water, where there's grass, where there's shade, where they can rest, where their needs are supplied. As the psalmist said, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And now notice carefully. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Every one of us faces adversity. We face persecution. We, first, we face illness. We face problems of various sorts. We face perplexity. We don't know what to do. But the person who knows God and knows of his love and understands what God has said about uh, what his attitude toward us is, who has read such passages as this, knows that God loves each one of us as a shepherd cares for his sheep. Of course, God loves us much more than any mere human shepherd could ever love sheep. But God is saying here that my love for you is like that, in the sense that the sheep have need and the shepherd provides for them. So it is that God knows of our needs. And in Luke 15, there is the parable of the lost sheep. A great many sheep are not lost, but one was lost, and the shepherd left to go in search of that one sheep. That shows that God loves every one of us individually. God knows every thought in my mind. There is not a possible way that I could ever keep a thought from God. He knows every problem I have. He knows every joy in life that I have. He knows every need I have. And we need to cry out, as did the Apostle Peter, as he was sinking, according to the record in Matthew 14, as he started to walk on the water going to Jesus. And as he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. We need to come to love God to the point that we'll respond in various situations to do that. We ought to do it every hour of every day. It ought to be a practice of our lives. As Paul said, pray without ceasing. So God loves us as a shepherd loves and cares for his sheep. Now, continuing right on in the 23rd Psalm, we find another picture. I'd like you to think about this as if we had been in a theater and we were seated and the curtains opened and we saw the scene of a shepherd caring for his sheep. And after seeing that lesson, then the, the curtain closed. And now we're sitting there waiting for the next scene to learn more about the love of God. And now the curtain opens, and lo and behold, we see a host who has prepared a great banquet for his guests. Notice carefully now the last two verses of Psalms 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice that God says, I'm like a man who's given a great feast and invited you. I have provided this wonderful feast. It's a bountiful feast. It's everything you could ever want to eat. And besides that, notice carefully, it's in the presence of your enemies. It's timely. It's a feast given when you needed it most of all. You know, sometimes we find that people bring us help, but it's too late. They want to help us. They come and say, is there anything I can do? But it's too late. And God is saying here, I not only will give you everything you need, that you really do need, not merely what you think you need, but I will give you what you need, and I will give it to you in time. I will give it to you when you need it. 
That's a marvelous thought to me, to realize that God is not only a great and gracious shepherd, but he is a bountiful host and one who gets there on time. He's never there with too little, too late. A bountiful host who gives a great banquet on time when you need it. Then we find that the Bible describes God under the figure of a husband. Just imagine that our curtains have closed on the picture of the great banquet. And now as we sit and wait, we see them opened. And here's a husband with his wife. And I turn to the book of Hosea. And there we find Hosea married to his wife, Gomer. And she is an unfaithful wife. And it seems she consorts with almost every man who passes by. And then word comes to Gomer. Some of these things are a little bit ambiguous in the scriptures at this point. But it seems to be that she is offered for sale in the slave market after her lovers have tired of her and thrown her aside, cast her aside as an old rag. But Gomer hears of it and goes and purchases her uh, out of that situation. And in effect says to her that if she will give evidence over a period of time of her repentance, he will take her back. Every one of us has to acknowledge to God that we're sinners, that we've done in effect the same thing in principle that Gomer did. Christ is married to the church. We find that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And so that relationship is carried throughout the Bible. God compared himself to the husband of Israel in the Old Testament. None of us is perfect. None of us is a perfect wife. None of us is a perfect husband. That doesn't mean that we've all been unfaithful to our companions, of course, but it does mean that every one of us has failures and shortcomings. But God says, I am a husband to you, and even though you've done wrong, even though you've sinned, even though you haven't done as you ought, I still love you. I want you to repent. Of course, God hasn't promised to save us in our sin. He hasn't promised to save us if we will not repent. But he has promised to save us in spite of our sins if we do. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Rome in the fifth chapter, said, For where sin did abound, grace did the more abound. Let me just draw here on the blackboard a moment a little illustration. Let's imagine that we have here a circle that represents our sin. Paul is saying here it doesn't matter how big the circle gets. The circle may be very small of your sin or mine, but God's grace will cover it if you're obedient to his will. Then you will find that here, where grace or the sin abounds much more, then God's grace will abound to go beyond it. And so it is that we can know, that we can know that God loves us in spite of the fact that you may look at your life today and say, I know that I've done so many terrible things, and I've had people to tell me this. I have done so many bad things, there simply isn't any way God could love me. There isn't any way I could be forgiven. That simply isn't so. It is a rejection of the grace of God, of the mighty power of the blood of Christ. Where sin did abound, grace did the more abound. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Everybody who hears and believes the gospel, trusting in the grace of God and the power of the blood of Christ to save him, can be saved from that sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. The great lesson then that God is our husband and he loves us in spite of our weaknesses. Now the curtain closes on that illustration and we come to another. An illustration given in Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. And it tells us of a mother and asks a question. Can a mother forget her sucking child? Yea, she may forget. But I will never forget thee. I have thee engraven on the palms of my hand. Thou art ever before me. You know, when we think about love in this life and the love that cannot be killed, we tend to think of the love of a mother for her children. Of course, of husband and wife. But certainly this is one of the great experiences of human life. The love of a mother for her child. Now we raise the question. Can a mother forget the child that she brought into this world? Well, it's not very likely. And yet often, or sometimes at least, we read in the newspapers, we hear on television news about a mother not only hurting her child, but even killing it. I recall reading about such instances as a mother being charged, at least, with killing her child by putting it in boiling water 
in a bathtub. That's a terrible, horrible thing. And yet it doesn't happen very often in comparison with the totalities of mothers who truly love their children. And God says, he raises the question, can a mother forget her sucking child, the, the child she's brought into this world? And he answers it. Yea, they may forget. It is possible they'll forget. It's not very likely. The percentage is low. But at least it's possible for a mother to forget her child and no longer love it. But God says, in contrast to that, But I shall never forget thee. Thou art always before me. Thou art written and engraven on the palms of my hand. Of course, God doesn't have physical hands as, you, as do you and I. But yet, he's saying here, here's an idea that's like it. It's just as if I had your name written in the palms of my hands, both of them. And I hold my hands out before me. And you're always before me. God never forgets. He knows. He knows about you. He knows about your problems. He loves you more even than a mother loves her child. Think about it. And you think about if you're a mother, how much you love your children. How devastated you'd be if you lost that child in death. Think about the love of your mother for you. But then compare it and say, I have to admit that the love of God is so far beyond that I cannot really grasp it. Well, the curtain closes on that scene. And then we open it in Psalms 103 in verse 13. And there the psalmist says that as a father pitieth and understandeth his son, so does God pity and understand us. My wife and I have a son and we have two daughters. When those children were small, when they were two, three, and four, we did not expect them to act as they do now, as they are mature people themselves with their own families. We understood their immaturity. Now, the Bible teaches that God is like that as a father. It doesn't mean that God condones our sin, but it does mean that he understands weakness in human life. It does mean that he understands our growing to spiritual maturity as we go along through life. And then I'd like to call your attention as the final point of our study as we look at this picture, this scene in our uh, sort of little theater approach. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Now notice he's not saying maybe. He says he will. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For to him that asketh, it shall be given. To him that seeketh, he shall findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. For what man is there of you whom, whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If my son were to come to me and say, Dad, I really need bread. My wife and my child do not have bread. I need bread. And let's say that I have some money and I have plenty of food in the house. And will I say to him, well, follow me out in the yard. And I take him out in the yard and I pick up a stone. And I say, there it is. Try that. Chew it. I wouldn't do that. If I know my heart, I would give my children, any or all of them, whatever it is I have, if they really need it. Now, God is saying to us, think about these relationships. You know that if your children came to you and asked you for help, you'd give it to them. If a man, what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now notice how the Lord reasons for us. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to, to them that ask him? You see, he's saying, you're evil. Every one of you has sinned. All of you fathers and mothers have sinned. But you know how to give good things to your children. Now, why can you not then lay hold on the fact that I am perfect? I'm not evil at all. I have no selfishness. I have no reason whatever to withhold any good thing. How we ought to be thankful then that we can go to God in prayer. I recall the words of David upon the death of his son, Absalom, even though he's a very wicked man and tried even to kill his father. And David cried out, O Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. May God help us to understand his love. Now we must quickly look in our closing moments 
If we love God, what will we do? Jesus said in John 14 and 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's foolishness for me to say, Oh, how I love Jesus, and then I will pay no attention to the Bible. I love Jesus, but I don't want to obey the will of God. I love Jesus, and I know that he said this or that, but I believe that I can be saved without doing it. No, you can say, I love Jesus, and call on the name of Christ, and sing, Oh, Jesus, Jesus. But that doesn't prove you love him. Notice in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that you keep his commandments. If you're a person who rejects the sacred teachings of the Bible, then you are not a person who loves God. I say that not to be ugly to you, but to plead with you and with all of us and with myself to recognize this great truth that it's impossible for me to love God if I do not obey him. Now, Jesus said in the giving of the Great Commission to his apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. My friends, you cannot give language fair import and not recognize that Jesus is saying that no believer is saved until he's baptized into Christ. I want to plead with you today not to say, not to give yourself credit, Oh, I love God, but then you turn away from the plain and simple teachings of the Bible. May God help you to search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Look at, look at Acts 17, 11 and see that God said that the people who did that are noble. And I pray that you'll do that. Don't take my word for anything that's been said today, but take your own Bible and read it. And may God bless and keep you is my sincere prayer.